So when comparing common Lisp to languages like C, Python, Rust, C++, pretty much any language out there, a lot of the comparison tends to be about syntax because people really love to talk about Lisp syntax and get upset about it and all that sort of stuff. And I think a lot of them are really missing what actually makes it special. And the big thing here is the actual concept of a Lisp image. You see, with common Lisp, it doesn't follow the normal pattern that you see of write, compile, run, and see if it worked. Instead, with Lisp, you actually start running it before you even write code. Um, and that's a very different environment from what you'd expect. And in fact, it kind of sounds similar to Python, but with Python, it's interpreted and Lisp, it's compiled. So how does this work? Well, the way it works is using a Lisp image. And like I said before, a Lisp image is very different from what you would expect to be working with in a lot of other languages where you have just code and then you have an executable in the end. Instead, you're actually writing the executable while you write your code. So the first thing that you'd work with when you're writing normal code is you would write the code, compile, and then you would run. So this is how you'd normally have your workflow. And with Lisp, it's a bit closer to run the actual Lisp image, and then you would write code, and then you would compile. And this is actually um, a bit closer to kind of like a circle. Uh, you're never really in one stage. You're kind of cycling between these, which is kind of similar to what you'd expect here, where you're writing code, testing it, and running it again, and all that sort of stuff. And so basically, the way that it works is you have something called a Lisp image. And the way that that works is let's just draw a little box right here. And so let's call this like your Lisp image. And so inside your Lisp image, you have different uh, symbols or functions. And so for example, you'd have like all the CL loop function that's in Lisp, and then you'd also have your own stuff like my, um, so this, and you'd have like all the CL namespace stuff. So you'd have like if and all that sort of stuff. Um, all the stuff that comes with common Lisp. So when you first start a uh, Lisp image, you end up with just a blank image and you add uh, different symbols to it. And so when you're writing code, so say I write a program, um, and I write a little function and I compile it with slime or something like that. So what I'm doing is I'm actually putting new code into my Lisp image. So now what we have here is we have basically the general stuff. So we've got our new function that we've put in and it's going into our Lisp image and there we go. So now we no longer need that arrow. We have our function in here. And so we've basically added code to our Lisp image and this code can actually run with our running image. Basically what we've done is we've started up a REPL, we've added code to the REPL, and we can execute it. And that might sound kind of simple, but the idea is that basically this Lisp image is constantly being updated. And then when we want to actually make a final executable, all we're basically doing is just dumping that image and then telling it what, what uh, symbol to start calling when we give it our program. So when we want to execute code, that's all we're doing is we're just calling a function in a Lisp image. And so this is kind of why the common Lisp build system is a bit strange. You aren't just making a single binary. You have to give it all this extra information. And that's basically because you're just taking kind of what you can accumulatively think of as kind of a operating system image. If you've ever installed a Linux distribution, it's kind of a similar idea. You're basically creating a state that the program will run in when you execute it and then giving that to the user. And that's what you're getting with a uh, disk image. What actual kind of benefits do you get out of this? Well, the biggest one is that your actual um, state when you build it is going to be pretty much identical to the state when you actually run it. So as an advantage, you basically, let's just move this over here. So when we get our final executable right here, you can actually make it possible to update it. So you get that same Lisp image as before, but you can actually add your own code and change things. So for example, um, say we copy this guy, and we put him here. And so here we have all the same stuff, but maybe we want to redefine loop. And we can do that while we have the executable. And so this might sound a bit uh, obtuse, and why would you even use this? But this is really powerful for debugging. If you guys have ever had a server that's run into issues um, and you want to see what's happening, you can actually interact with it live just via a simple REPL. Um, and let's give you guys a really good example of this using the Nixt browser, which is written in common Lisp. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and pull that open. All right, so switching over to the Nixt browser, you'll see a few things. There's just a little browser right in front of us. And if we want to run a command, the first thing we'll want to do is run this command called start uh, slink. Now this will run, you'll see right down here, running on uh, port 4006. So I'll just open up Emacs uh, just for this video. And in Emacs, I will run sly connect. All right, now that we have this REPL running, 
and we are connected to that running Lisp image, we can actually manipulate it. So for example, if we wanted to, I don't know, let's see what another command is. Uh, let's do like watch mode. We get access to it right here, as you guys can see. And we can even go to the definition. Yeah, and we can go to the definition. We can uh, obviously, you can see the documentation right there, but if we wanted to, we could see the documentation. It gives you a lot of information. Um, but anyways, that's not what we'll be working on today. So like I said before, you get a lot of an advantage out of this um, out of this program that we have here because we can actually manipulate it since it's a Lisp image. And so because of that, you can actually look at the original source code. Um, there we go. I have the original source code for the start slink right here. Uh, I just jumped to the definition right before switching. Um, and we get a lot of information and we can even evaluate code that will active uh, be active in the browser. Comment this out and make it just echo hello world, All right? Everyone's favorite thing to do. Now I could compile that. And then in next, if I just run start slink, it will print hello world. So there you go, there's the proof that we are actually editing the current instance. And so a common thing that you will notice is that you'll sometimes wanna be able to change things. So for example, um, if I were to evaluate this, we'll see that this is a set port number. We can't actually change it um, when we run it. So that's not particularly helpful. And so if we were to run it again, I assume we'll get an error. Oh, sorry, I gotta recompile it. And so now if we run it again, start slink, yeah, we get an error because the address is already in use. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna actually manipulate this to make it better and make it so that way it can handle errors like this. Because uh, while in this case, the port is in use because we're actually connected to a REPL, port 4006 could be in use for really any reason. And it would be nice to make it so that way the user can change this uh, without having to manually manipulate the code. And so for this case, what we'll wanna do um, is we will want to, let's just recenter this. So there we go. So we've just narrowed it to the current function. Now what we're going to go ahead and do is actually handle this. So we're going to want to write a handler case. Um, and this is basically how you handle errors. And we'll just uh, wrap this guy, a progin. Um, just that way when it handles an error, it will skip over both of these guys. Um, and then for the kind of error that we want to handle, we're going to do in, uh, what did it say? Do, 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 do. Socket bind address already in use. Um, here, we'll just go ahead and uh, what do we want to do? We'll just do error. So we'll just catch all errors. Um, we don't really care what kind of error it was. Uh, and then we will have to do something with it. And then next up, we'll want a way to handle this error. Um, so I've actually written this part ahead of time uh, just to kind of save us some time in this video. There we go. So now what we're doing now, basically this looks actually very similar to the original, but all we're doing is we're adding this handle case, which will basically catch any error, which in this case will be when the port is already in use. Um, and then what we will do is we'll bind the result. Um, and so when I say result in this case, that will just be uh, the port number and it'll prompt for this port number using the prompt uh, function. This is actually part of next. I can just go ahead and jump to the definition. Um, pretty neat. So basically how this will be done is we'll basically call this function, we'll get the result and store it in result, and then we will parse it as an integer. And then when we have a port number, we will go ahead and start slink again. Um, so let's go ahead and compile that. And then in next, we will go ahead and run start slink. Oh, my solution did not work. One sec. So just in case, I'm just gonna go ahead and run start slink again and catch the, hmm, it doesn't actually say error in here. Oh no, it says error there. I don't know, this might not be necessary. But we'll go back to the code again and we will just replace the error with this and this will basically say exactly what kind of error this is. Technically it's a condition, but we won't get too technical for this. Um, and so now in here and run start slink, there we go. Now we will be prompted for the user input and we'll just do 4002 hit enter, and then it will start the port on 4002. Um, pretty cool, and all we did was actually manipulate the original code. If we go back to the original, we can always go back to the original, and if we were to restart next, it will just use the original code. Um, but if we were to add this to like, say for example, our configuration um, or anything like that, then we can actually load that code into the Lisp image. And this is kind of how Lisp in general works. When we're compiling code, that's all we're doing. We're taking a Lisp image, putting in new functions and symbols, um, and then we're 
basically dumping an image of it. Anyways, guys, that's all for today's video. I just wanted to kind of show off the power that you get from a Lisp image, as well as the kind of advantages you get. What I just did with Nixt is something you can't do with pretty much any other browser. Uh, could you imagine trying to recompile Chrome every time you wanted to make a small change with a plugin or something like that? No, that's why JavaScript is used for a lot of stuff. And there isn't really a lot of options out there besides this. And this is kind of where I think Common Lisp really has a strong force is when it comes to extensibility as well as prototyping. Because as you guys could see, I was able to literally run my program and see my changes as I was changing them. This is something that video game uh, engines have tried for a long time to do. Some of them can kind of do it, but a lot of them do it using like scripting engines and they're not going to be compiled. They're not going to be as performant, but common Lisp is fairly performant. It's way more performant than most, pretty much any scripting language out there. It's faster than a lot of compiled and even typed languages out there. So you're not really losing out on anything here and you're getting a lot of performance and you're getting an environment that you can kind of work around uh, your workflow which is really powerful. And it kind of is the big reason that it really is just the best prototyping language out there. There's not really anything that's gonna beat it, um, in my opinion. And a really quick shout out to all my supporters on Patreon. So I wanted to shout out Alexander. And once again, I wanted to give a really big shout out to my supporters on Patreon. That's Alexander Altam Artemenko, Jim Lawson, Miguel, Russell Willis, and Connor G. And in addition, I wanted to give a big shout out to Palatinus and Tall Guy Jenks. Once again, all of you guys, both on Patreon and GitHub sponsors, I really appreciate your support. It gives me a lot of motivation to keep making these videos. I know it's been a bit of downtime recently. Um, I apologize for all the uh, delays. Luckily, I have freed up. My free time is finally back and I can start making content again, um, which is great. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Expect more Common Lisp content soon. I have a lot of stuff piled up, and I finally have time to record it, so you'll be seeing more pretty soon. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye.